welcoming to the stage Dr. Gabriel Seaborth from Accenture and Michael Hubel, uh, the co-founder of Flink. So good morning, everyone. We are here on stage with Gabriel Seibert from Accenture. He's a consultant working in the automotive industry, uh, mostly advising large OEMs in Germany on their digital strategies. And Michael Hübel, who is um, the co-founder of Flink, which is a German car sharing platform. Quite successful, actually, I heard. And what we're going to do is, um, we thought it's, you know, presentations are nice, but let's have a discussion on, on one of the big issues in the car industry, which is how does the digital transformation actually have an impact on car makers? And this leads us to the question whether car makers will still be relevant in 10 years' time as new services develop, as platforms develop. And um, I'd say that we, we should start with the question, um, Gabriel, what is your opinion on the digital, digital transformation and the impact the digital transformation has on consumer needs, but also on, on the car makers themselves? How does this affect them? Um, and all the colleagues mentioned that, that there's a large interest in connected cars. Uh, but in our view, this is only the beginning, so there is some kind of a tra trajectory from connected cars towards connected drivers. Of course, it's much more interesting to connect the drivers, the, the actual users, than the cars itself. And so there will be some kind of um, ecosystems, um, closed ecosystems in the first, in the first instance, where the, um, the OEMs will build up brand worlds, where they, they bring in services, their own services, like their financial services, and so on. Then there will be open ecosystems, like we see that from the smartphone industry. That will be an interesting point when that kicks in. And then in the end, of course, the, there will be uh, mobility services, and that mobility services will be, the, let's say, the largest um, change for, the, for the, um, the OEMs. And the question is, and this is what we're talking about, what role will the hardware play into that new configuration? Um, so OEMs, what, what will they need to do? They need to change, of course. They need to come up with new business models, which they currently haven't. There's only one business model established, which is the um, selling of products. New business models will be largely centered around services and around data. Um, OEMs will need to, um, to learn to get into this consumer-driven business. Currently, they have one large transaction in the beginning, and then that's it. And then the dealers serve the aftermarket and so on. And there will be smaller, continuous transactions, a continuous client um, relationship, which the OEMs currently don't have and don't, don't even know how to establish and to use. So Michael, you're one of these digital transformers, obviously. What's your take? I think that we will have a huge paradigm shift from owning cars to sharing cars, renting cars, just using cars. Um, from my point of view, you know, I don't have a car right now. Uh, all my friends don't have a car uh, right now, and we don't use them. We don't need them. Uh, we live in big cities. Uh, we are completely organized, multimodal. Um, and we are completely flexible with that. So why do I need to buy a car? I, I, I don't see the point here. Um, and uh, as we all know, the population in the future, they will live in cities, they will live in big cities. So why should they buy cars then? Um, and I think that car makers, they have to ask themselves the question, what does my customer really want? And I think that the true answer to that is not that the customer wants to buy a car. He does not want to buy a car. He does not want to own a car. What he wants is to get from A to B. He wants to be flexible. He wants to get from A to B. And people in the future, they will not stick to a car manufacturer. They will stick to the service that helps them to get from A to B. So as car makers are facing this paradigm shift, right? Gabriel, do you think they are actually prepared to, to make this change from products to services and from like car buyers to car users? Well, I would say yes and no. Um, car makers spend a lot of money into innovation. Actually, they are under the top three industries worldwide to do that. Volkswagen is the number one R&D um, company, 13 billion a year. Um, but this is largely uh, product innovation. Um, so sustaining innovation, um, if you want. And um, they would really need to shift that the emphasis from pro product innovation towards business model innovation, which they are currently um, weaker at compared to the, the internet companies. And um, 
if they can do that shift and if they can can reallocate their their um, spendings and all the the investments and the all the power which they have, then I think they're they're well prepared. And um, actually, they all, they also have an, uh, another um, asset. Um, they are there for more than 100 years. Um, they have a very strong brand. Um, why should they not be able to use that brand and transform it into the internet world? So, Michael, do you agree? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> I, I fear for the German economy that they are not prepared. I mean, look at Uber. Look how fast they scaled their business worldwide. I mean, it is like a month and years. I mean, I can get in any plane here in Frankfurt, fly to anywhere in the world, and I can open up Uber, and they provide mobility for me. And it's a brand that two years ago, nobody knew that. So I don't think that brand is, has any, any, any value uh, currently. And um, yeah, so, so, so car manufacturers, in my point of view, they are not prepared very well uh, right now. And, and Uber is a good point because Uber is doing nothing else than providing a platform, right? They don't build cars, they don't even own the cars they, they, they have, right? So, talking about platforms, Gavio, do you think that car makers can just recreate a platform like, like Uber's? No, why, why are platforms so important in the age of connected mobility? Um, so what we're actually seeing is that the, the, um, the car is interconnecting with, with its environment. So it was capsuled in, in, the, in the past, but it will be um, part of an all IP world. This is the, the notion of the Internet of Things. And within this, this Internet of Things, there will be um, Internet technologies, of course. These Internet technologies are platforms, like we heard. Uber is one example. Um, and another thing which is important is that um, in this Internet world, you don't have classical value chains. It is more about value networks, an equal network of partners. Um, in the platform, business is usually prosumers, so they, they consume and, and, and produce in the same way. And um, there will be um, platforms who, who, who match that demand and supply. And this is why, um, why these platforms are so inherently important. Um, they will be the matchmakers, and the matchmaker will define the, the rules of the game, of course. You can see that at Apple, for example, the Apple ecosystem, if you're developer, you need to comply to their, to their rules and policies. And this is why this platform game is, is very, very important. Platforms use um, network effects. They scale very, very fast. This is why they can, like you said, with Uber, they can come out of the blue, can be there in, in an instant. But, but also, we have seen that, that these platform business models are instable. And they're, they're very vulnerable to trends. And this can shift very, very rapidly. So look to, for example, who remembers MySpace? Um, they actually invented what Facebook is today, and they're gone. And there are more examples than that. And this is what the, plat the, the, the pure internet platform players need to prove, that they really have a sustaining business model, not just a fancy idea. And what I think basically is the, the difference. Uber is not a brand, like you said. Um, and Uber will never be a brand. This is really about cost efficiency. And they don't have something like an emotional brand. But the Apple example shows that if you have an emotional brand and if you can combine and, and a very luxury product with a very superior ecosystem, then you can, can gain the, the largest profits. I, I, I agree that nobody knows MySpace anymore, but I also see that nobody knows uh, Nokia anymore. Uh, so even well-known brands uh, uh, have to fear that they are, are just uh, going away. And uh, maybe I can give an example from my, my personal life. Uh, I, I think in, in the past, and, and of course some, some people uh, today, uh, when they need a car, uh, their, their, their decision is brand driven. So I go to a car seller and I say, okay, I want to have a BMW because I like brand. Or I go to Sixth and I say, I want to uh, rent a Mini because I always wanted to drive a Mini. Uh, in my personal life, I don't have a car. So when I need a car to get to a meeting, for example, I have different options. I can go to Drive Now, to Cutigo, to Flinkster, uh, all these platforms. Uh, I go into the app, I say, I want a car right now. Flinkster shows me different cars in my area. And at this point of, uh, in, in, in this moment, my decision is not brand-based anymore. I don't say, okay, I want the BMW, where's the BMW, where's the Mercedes? No, I look which car is the most nearest to me. And I don't care if it's a VW, if it's Skoda or, or anything else. I just use the car that is uh, the nearest to me. And then I, I take the car, I go to my meeting, in the meeting, somebody asks me, Michael, how do you get here? And then I will not say, 
I got here with the Skoda. I will say, I got here with Flinkster. So the face to the customer is Flinkster. The brand is Flinkster. It's not the car maker. It's not the car uh, uh, brand anymore. But don't you think, I mean, speaking of, of brands, right? I mean, car makers have very, very strong brands. Why don't they? I mean, they, they should be prepared to transform this into the digital age, right? Use the brand power and build new services around this. I mean, what, what, what would you think? Uh, yeah, this is actually also what, what, what I think. But there's this interesting um, thing, um, which currently we can also see that on, on all um, speeches within the IAA. The, the, the auto um, CEOs, they ask themselves, what are these new players? Are they our premium suppliers of the future? Will, will, they, will they be competing enemies? All this kind of um, uncertainty. Um, uh, Dieter Zetsche said they're frenemies, so they're both, uh, which is actually true. And he also said even that he could think of a joint venture with, um, with Google. So we will see very interesting alliances upcoming and um, very interesting reconfigurations of the value chain. Um, I think what is clear so far is that no one can really dominate this kind of ecosystem. No one can do it alone, even not the, um, the internet companies. Internet companies usually can, cannot do products. Um, Apple is, is an, is an, is an ex uh, exception of that rule, but Apple, I would not really count them as an internet company. They're not data-driven, unless uh, not, not that far. They try to, to become that. They're in a similar situation like the, like the OEMs in that respect. Um, but um, I think in the Internet of Things equation, you have the Internet and you have the things, the physical assets. And you need to combine both, and no one currently is able to do that alone. So there will, there really will be alliances in the, the, um, the here, Nokia here transaction is, I think, an interesting um, early signal of this new uh, role of alliances. So as you said, no one is able to do it alone. So you and the Flink is cooperating with OEMs, right? So, so how do these car makers See you. How did you see your startup? How how is the cooperation actually? I, I think uh, they need us. Uh, they need us to learn, and I, I, I can highly encourage uh, the big car makers uh, to learn more from startups. Um, from my point of view, uh, you know, look at Facebook. When Facebook wants to do a new photo feature because they are not happy with their current photo feature, what are they doing? They, mostly they are buying a startup. They are buying a new startup uh, because these people are very talented and they're very experienced in that special thing, building a photo app. And uh, then they're integrating uh, them into the company, making a new department, uh, the photo department. Um, and I think this is something that car makers can learn from. Car makers should go to startup, should, uh, startups should invest into startups and they should buy startups making talent buyouts to get new talent into the company, uh, getting more innovative people into the company uh, so they can uh, invent new features. So that sounds of, of, as if all the future is going to be about um, digital, about getting this kind of startup agility into the car makers' DNA. I mean, I mean, is that the case? I mean, do car makers need to change in that way? Do they need to buy startups? Or can they do it on their own? I mean, well, I think that, that, um, that if Facebook, if Facebook is buying a startup, this is more than to neutralize them as a competition rather than to infuse the... And, you, and Yahoo, for example, is also buying these kind of startups and also Microsoft started to buy, um, to buy these startups. Microsoft, interestingly, I think, because they cannot master open innovation, so they need to, to have closed innovation and because no one is innovating for them, they need to buy these people. I don't see that as a sign of strength. Um, and this is something which, which OEMs also could, could easily do. To, to, um, to buy companies, but they also they but they're to, not doing it. Yeah, they need to keep them then also in their, in, within their, their organization. And I think there is, of course, a large change um, ahead for the OEMs. Um, they are by now software companies and without even clearly no noticing that. And um, we've seen earlier this kind of uh, lines of code in the, in the car. I think the S-Class today has 100, one, 100 million lines of code. This is really enormous. And um, Daimler, for example, is now building up this kind of dedicated software unit. And for these units, they, of course, start to compete with the, with the traditional startups, software companies, tech giants, for, for resources, for people. And of course, they will, all, they will consider all their options. And one option will probably also be to buy, to buy teams. But they also then need to keep them in their, within their organization and 
the, this small startup will not transform the organization of an OEM, rather the OEM will transform the organization of the startup. So this is a lot of change which they need to do, but the OEMs had a lot of change in the past. So we had all this servitization trend which they did, they have all financial services units, they have a, a large range of services which they offer today. Um, they, they mastered a lot of chance, they, they, they cha uh, changed, they reduced their, their value, depth of value add, um, they, they mastered today eco open ecosystems with their two suppliers. Um, it is hardware based yet, but they do all that and why shouldn't they be able to, to um, prolong that into the future? But obviously there are some very strong competitors from the digital economy out there, right? So isn't there a risk of the car makers becoming interchangeable producers of, of commodities, you know? The car as a hardware while, while like the Google, the Apple, the Uber makes profits uh, with services, you know? Yeah, Michel mentioned that, that, that Nokia example, of course, that is a prominent example. So that, that, that risk is there and the, the OEMs see that and they all also acknowledge that, that they have that risk and this is why they're really actively investing now. The, the Nokia here example is, is, is a prominent and recent one. So they see that, that, um, that, uh, that threat, but on the other hand, I would see that as very, um, I would differentiate, for example, between premium brands and, and um, mass brands. And um, again, the Apple example shows that, that a strong brand is the, is the largest um, um, profit pool exploit option that you have. Um, and this is really a very interesting model for the OEMs and they're all looking, so BMW said that they would like to become the German Apple. And I think that is really what it's about. The, the, um, the, the car is the ultimate mobile device and the question is who is, who is, um, who is on the one hand um, manufacturing this ultimate mobile device, who is owning and controlling the customer interface and who will channel all these kind of new services to, towards this customer. Well, Michael, you said in the beginning that your friends, for example, don't care about the car brands anymore. So that's a case in point for, for car makers becoming commodity, right? I think that's exactly what will happen. I think cars are only hardware that I will uh, use for a special use case. So, for example, if I want to go to a meeting, I want to have a car with a big table in it so I can work. If I want to travel overnight, I want to get a car with very nice seats so I can take a nap. Um, and I think this is how we will use cars in the future. We will just pick the car, rent the car that I need for my special use case. And it will depend on the use case, not the brand. Well, let's, let's conclude this discussion with a final statement, Gabriel. In 10 years, 2025, how relevant will car makers still be, in your opinion? Well, 10 years, maybe let's say 20 years, or even 25 to 30 years. But I think the, um, the car makers will exist, um, and especially the premium um, car makers, but they will not be car makers like we know them today. They will be technology providers, they will be mobility providers, and they will have large software units. They might also serve um, different industries, like for example, insurance industries. They will sell their data to, to, to insurance companies and so on. So there will be uh, a lot of indirect revenue sources, um, and they, will, they might, also serve um, different devices with their software, so they might not be limit themselves to cars. So there will be a lot of um, change be ongoing, but I think the, the established brands that we have today, they will be there the next 100 years, sure. So Michael, will car makers still be in the driver's seat in 10 years? I think that car will be, cars will only be hardware. What people really want are not buying cars, they want mobility. If car makers can provide that mobility, can provide that service, can provide that platform, they will be relevant. When they can't manage uh, that process, somebody else will come and uh, they will die. Interesting outlook into the future. Well, thank you for the discussion. It was interesting to learn more about the future of the car makers. We see it's still an open race, right? Nothing is decided yet. And we are very excited about the next 10 years and the future of the car industry. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So uh, thank you very much for that format. I think that was a, a great alternative to speaking. It was interesting that Dr. Siebert and, uh, and Michael ended up in a conversation, uh, certainly about business models, but very much about brands. And a brand is a component of a business model. At the Kellogg School of Management, where I teach, of course, marketing is very important. Uh, a lot of us know, a lot of people know us as a marketing school. 
And uh, there's a very big difference between creating a new brand like Flink or Uber. I don't have a car, by the way. I'm like Michael and his friends. I use Uber all the time. There's a big difference between creating a brand new brand and repurposing an existing brand, transforming an existing brand. So about five years ago in 29, 10, 11, I was working a lot with Castrol Corporation, the big lubricants company. And uh, the CEO of the company, Mike Johnson at the time, immensely successful, he's since retired, but did a great job at that time. He asked a provocative question to his leadership team. And again, this was 2010, before anyone had been convinced that electric vehicles would go anywhere. And by the way, it's important to note that electric vehicles take no lubrication in the engine. So he said, what will we sell in the future when no one needs lubrication? The CEO of Castrol said to his leadership team, how will we make money when no one needs lubrication? And his profound insight was, we have a brand, and sure, it's about lubricants today, but it's about engine safety, it's about performance. How can we transition this brand to being vital in the future, to having a powerful role in the world, when, for instance, we're no longer just a car maker? That was a beautiful discussion. Uh, I'll also point out that the moderator used an interesting metaphor, which was, will the car makers still be in the driver's seat? Well, in 20 years with self-driving cars, there will be no driver's seat. 